So in today's case, we are dealing with a very mysterious death, and the circumstances surrounding this death are incredibly suspicious. Strangely, the only reason anyone hears about this case is that the victim's mother is talking about it. Her desire to get to the bottom of what happened to her son is so motivating and passionate that she is determined to find out the truth. It would be helpful if you could like this video, share it as many times as you can, and follow the mother's Facebook page. I believe this case is unfathomably insane, and justice must be served. I would also like to thank our loyal fan, who brought our attention to this case. It is the case of Brandon Embry. He's a brilliant, gifted guy who has multiple degrees. Because you hear this about Brandon, and then you understand what happened to him, that doesn't seem to match. Quite frankly, something quite bizarre must have occurred. As you know tonight we will be talking about the death of Brandon Embry, who passed away on September 12, 2019 at the age of 33. This is taking place in Asheboro, North Carolina. Brandon Emery is a military brat who was born into a military family. Anyone who knows about military families will understand. They move around a lot. So he spent a great deal of time in different parts of the United States and some time in Italy. Brandon moved from one school to another in his youth, studying at both colleges in South Carolina and New York City. During his childhood, he was an amateur powerlifter. However, after he sustained some pretty bad injuries, he was not allowed to lift anymore. Most of his time, he was at work. However, he did get to socialize on the weekends. In the end, he joined the military straight out of high school when he was 18 years old, then in the Navy, where he achieved the rank of nuclear machinist mate officer second class while in the service. He continued his studies at the University of Washington even after his military service was over. As a result, he has attained several degrees, including bioengineering and chemical pre-engineering. It was not only to be with his family that he moved from Washington to North Carolina, but also for a short break after he had broken up with his girlfriend. As of right now, it appears that he is doing all right. Following this move, he was able to rent an apartment in Asheboro. During this time, he was working for a company based out of Charlotte, North Carolina. Let's move forward to September 2019, right after Embry returned from Chicago to celebrate his birthday with his family. And what happened after that is something that needs to be discussed. In the meantime, Brandon's mom asked him to watch the dogs for her because she had to drive all the way to Kentucky to pick up his sister. Brandon had therefore been watching the dogs on September 6th. That was just one day before his birthday. For which he had plans. The day was going to be spent with Cassandra Welch, his girlfriend at the time. Unfortunately, she had to cancel. And so, as the day came and went, it ended. His mother spoke to him on the phone on Saturday, wishing him a happy birthday. It seems that it was maybe in the morning at that time, but his parents never heard from him on Friday or Saturday. He made only one call on his birthday, and the rest of the messages were just weird texts, in which his mother commented that this wasn't like Brandon at all. Brandon sent paragraphs instead of short texts. But these texts were short. Brandon's writing style and even some of the words did not look like his. So she called to figure out what was wrong, but she did not receive an answer or a call back from him. It seems to her that something is a little off about this. She hasn't heard from him for a while now. Her mommy instincts are making her feel that way, but the way these texts are coming in, it just doesn't feel right. But she gave him one more day, maybe he'll call her but she actually woke up on Tuesday morning when Brandon texted her. Again, it doesn't sound like Brandon. Also, the timing of the message was odd. Just because Brandon never was so early. On the same day, Brandon made a purchase from an adult store with his debit card. But why would Brandon buy anything from an adult store? His mother said he may have bought something for his girlfriend, 
so he hasn't contacted her in days. So, she called her daughter and said the first thing they were doing in the morning was to check on Brandon. Then on Thursday, they go to his apartment and knock on the door. They bang on the windows. Nobody answers. After that, she thought, okay, maybe Brandon's playing video games. He loves video games. Or perhaps he's just sleeping. As they walked toward the back door, they noticed that one of the windows had been damaged. At this point, she realized that there was something extraordinary going on. Brandon wasn't answering. His car was outside. The window was broken. Sarah calls him, but still no answer. So about 15 minutes after they got there, Sarah called 911. So when they arrived at the house, they went in, but the mother never came into the house. They make Sarah and Brandon's sister wait outside for them while they go into the apartment to check it out. At first, she was not allowed in, and thank God for that. But what did they find? Brandon was found naked and unresponsive, on the floor, with a pool of blood surrounding him. Also, there's a pool of blood from his head that's covering his body. In fact, he was still alive, but it appeared he had trouble breathing. They tried to pull the mother and her daughter across to the other side so she wouldn't see Brandon come out with a white sheet on him and a tube of oxygen on his face. She could only see his face covered in blood when he came out. Then they take him to the hospital. Sarah and her daughter follow behind the ambulance. This scene flashed back to seven months ago when he was intubated. But this time the doctor's telling her. That doesn't look good at all. The doctors don't think that he is going to make it this time. The only thing that remains for them to do is to transport him to a higher level of care. He is thrilled to Moses Hospital in Greensboro. I think he was a true warrior in the sense that counting back, he was unconscious by Monday and was not found until Thursday. And he died on Friday. He really held on for a very long time. He suffered tremendously throughout that time. See all the things that were wrong with him medically. I believe that he indeed suffered. Currently, investigators are seeking answers to the mystery. They're looking at the apartment, which was pretty messy. The bathroom is flooded. Water is running into the bathtub, which is broken. I don't think Brandon even took a bath. The door to the toilet was ripped off the hinges. The toilet tank was smashed into two pieces. In fact, one of the pieces was propped up against the bathtub. As for the other piece, it was located in the bedroom. There was blood all around the toilet. The mirror in the room also had blood on it. It was also on the door of the bathroom. The blood was on his bedroom door and the window sill, On the closet doors in the bedroom, which were also ripped off their hinges. There was blood all over the bed and bedroom wall. There were black hair strands on the bedroom wall. Drawers from dressers were taken out, shower curtain rods were taken down, and towel bars were taken down from the wall. There are marks all over the place that make it appear that something terrible just happened. The marks make it appear as if there had been a tremendous fight. The blood is everywhere you look. On the back of the toilet, that heavy, heavy piece was torn in half. In one part of the apartment, there was a part of it leaning against the wall, and the other half was in the bedroom. Unfortunately, what sucks about this case is that investigators did not really investigate the scene as you would imagine. To be fair, the mother found most of the items I spoke about earlier. As the officers appeared to be investigating the scene, they collected some evidence and took a few photos of the scene. Right off the bat, one of the detectives mentioned to Biff to Sarah that it seemed he had taken a large amount of drugs and had flipped out. So that is what she hears when she is still trying to understand what happened to her son, Brandon. So Sarah told the female detective Brandon wasn't on drugs. She knows he wasn't doing that. It turns out that the boy was not doing meth. Instead, he was actually drug tested for work. So he was not doing meth. A few times, he changed jobs, and every one of them tested him for drugs. On top of that, she had been spending more time with him lately and he didn't seem to show any signs of being hooked on drugs. As it turns out, she had been at his apartment helping him pack. As we can see from the crime scene photos, Brandon was moving out, and he was packing many boxes. 
Despite this, the boxes were organized correctly. But Brandon was somewhat messy. Also, the boxes were empty. Everything was just dumped out. She doesn't get to see all of this until about 10 months later, when she gets the crime scene photos. Not 10 days later, but 10 months later. So that makes her feel that her son's death isn't being investigated from the outset. Initially, at least from the perspective of Sarah, she has a sense that detectives are not looking at it that way. To them, Brandon is the one who committed this act. However, Sarah does not believe this to be true. She concludes that the guy was attacked while fighting, there was an intruder in the apartment, something went down, and he was hit. There was blood on the walls, and it looked like bloody footprints. The bathroom was destroyed. The place was a mess. She could also see the spray on the wall and the black blood stains in the bathroom. As she said, you could tell an attempt had been made to clean up the mess. There were spray spots. There were Clorox wipes in the toilet. The spray was nowhere to be found. So the blood got sprayed. In the hallway, there were bleach and bleach crystals at the door of the other bathroom. The fact that the hallway seemed to have been cleaned made her think it was odd. Yet, there was still debris in other places in the apartment that needed attention. Even though one of the detectives commented that the hallway appeared to have been cleaned up, nothing was found. There are forensic officers believed to show up at crime scenes and collect evidence that investigators may use to establish what happened. However, Sarah noticed that the hair left on the wall didn't appear to be collected. The hair wasn't even documented. Now, that's where they failed to back up proper evidence. As I mentioned earlier, some of the evidence related to the case was found by the mother. It turned out that she was finishing the work of the investigators since they did not complete their task. She then said we would have to call the detectives over again. There was the male detective, the lead detective, and the female detective, who was his assistant. She is, in fact, the one who said that he was on meth, and this indeed is what people on meth do, which is to spray and clean their blood on the walls. To find out what happened to him, Sarah kept asking hospital staff about his injuries. Interestingly, both groups agree that these did not appear to be self-inflicted. Nurses say that he looks like someone who has been hit by a vehicle. One of them even told her to call the police because Brandon might have had offensive wounds on his hands and body. He's going to get an autopsy. There will be a toxicology report where they will test his blood and other fluids for drugs. It happens on September 16, 2019. According to the chief medical examiner, Brandon's blood did not contain any signs of illicit substances. All efforts were made to ascertain whether Brandon had taken any drugs. However, the only thing that was found was Benadryl. We now have an idea of what happened to Brandon, thanks to the results of the autopsy. The report stated that based on the autopsy and investigation findings, as they are currently understood, the cause of death is pneumonia with hypertension and cardiovascular disease. A severe case of pneumonia can lead to sepsis and multi-organ failure, depending on the chest X-ray results. An enlarged heart can cause a lack of oxygen in the brain. We don't know what caused Brandon's superficial injuries, but they didn't contribute to the death. This is classified as a natural cause of death. Now let's get to the superficial injuries. It just blows my mind how many superficial injuries there are. There are a lot of injuries in all of his organs. The first emergency room doctor showed her that the urine bag contained a lot of sediment. He said that if you look closely, it appears his kidneys are crumbling. He was bruised to the point that some bruises weren't on the search warrant, and others she didn't see because they had him hooked up to three forms of life support. His mother Sarah got an autopsy copy. She noticed several injuries not marked on the visual diagram, so she had to add additional injuries to our copy of the autopsy diagram. There were injuries to the knuckles on his left hand, the top of his spine, and bruises on both sides of his head, also his back and left arm. In the photos of Brandon's body, you can see miles of bruises, scratches, and punctures. Many speculate that stun guns may have caused these wounds. 
There was no evidence that he was high on meth, however. So, as the detective claimed, we have not had a meth-fueled freakout. Then she goes back to the doctor and says, hey, he didn't have any drugs in his system. Well, he was sick with pneumonia, and people with that can be hysterical, so he probably had a freakout and flipped around his apartment or something like that. There are also a couple of injuries that they didn't seem to mention. The bruises on his legs and shins were unfortunate. You could almost imagine that it was he who was being thrown into things just by looking at the way the bathroom is smashed up. It's just evident that his skin is bruised all over. As far as I can tell, the knees and shins are messed up. I would imagine that if he were to be dragged to his knees, he would suffer severe burns and cuts that bad. Even though superficial is used, there's much more to it than that. My understanding of superficiality is that he had a cut or two. He has been cut and bruised from head to toe. I don't know what happened to him, but it's easy to call bruises and cuts superficial. But beating someone repeatedly with a bat isn't superficial. All of his body is covered in blood. His head had a big spot of blood on it. It looked like blood spatters. It almost reached the ceiling. A bloody top is not just the result of someone falling and hitting their head or from someone sustaining blunt force trauma. It came to the investigation. The fact that they were somewhat quiet meant they were investigating, but then they weren't investigating. In fact, when they found him, it looked like his clothes had been peeled off of him as well. They found him soaked and hypothermic. He had peeled his clothes off because they were wet, or somebody took his clothes off because that's the same way it would look. Also, there should be more blood, but it seems like it's been cleaned up. Because he's soaking wet, he doesn't have blood running off of him. There may have been some kind of cleanup. Sarah mentioned she talked to the forensics team when she was there. She pointed it out. They told her it's possible Brandon was trying to clean up, too. But where did he dispose of the bleach bottle? There was also a shoe print on the closet door. The way Sarah is looking around the apartment at the moment, it seems as if somebody has struck Brandon, and he has fallen back into the closet. Also, there were lines of blood imprinted on the wall and the floor. Other family members, including his mother, remember Brandon wearing a specific shirt that had like ribs or textured lines on it. According to her, those lines exactly match Brandon's. She assumes he was wearing this shirt and bleeding profusely through it before being thrown around the room. They also found a bottle of generic Walmart bleach. Sarah said if he had bought bleach, he would have bought a brand name bleach, not a store brand bleach. She would now do these little things. She knows Brandon better than the people working at the scene. Anyhow, she felt like investigators weren't collecting every bit of evidence and weren't taking pictures of everything. Something feels wrong. Does anyone ever hear of someone being so sick that they become aggressive or destructive? You know, like if he's dying of pneumonia, we'd assume he'd be in bed. Maybe he'll take a cold bath if he's overheated. He may have slipped and fallen. But as we said before, the whole apartment was a total mess. As if somewhere in that apartment had gone crazy. I've never heard of anyone going crazy from pneumonia. The weird part is we know that people freak out sometimes. And sometimes they wreck their own apartments. But in this case, it is being blamed on pneumonia. And the logic of it all just doesn't seem to make any sense. It was listed as a cause of death for natural pneumonia as well as for hypertension. As it turned out, Brandon had hypothermia, a severe condition documented in his medical records. Let's say you have pneumonia. You're near death. Suddenly you become frantic and make a mess of your apartment. It is not that you do not have the money to clean up your mess, well, not even all of it so that it stops in the hallway. I think if someone attacked him, they might have left a fingerprint or blood on the wall. They left it all behind. Maybe they were rushed. The reason why I am mentioning all of this is that Brandon's mother has done her investigation. A couple of days later, the police came to check on Brandon's truck. They found it unlocked. 
and this was not the way Brandon normally behaved. He usually locks his vehicle. So it turns out there were some traces of blood left in his car. Blood smears can also be seen on some of the seats by the pedals. And the floor mat looks like it's been washed. But the fact that they found evidence in both his apartment and his vehicle did not seem to concern the police. And as far as I can tell, the explanations for this not being foul play are falling apart. But the big question here is, why did Brandon do all this to himself? Then drive around in his truck? He then tried to clean up the blood in the car too. There's no explanation for why there's blood in the car. During the morning of September 18, 2019, Sarah was contacted by Cassandra Welch. Cassandra said she was Brandon's girlfriend. And she had information on Brandon. Then she asked Sarah, hey, I'd like to get my belongings that are still at Brandon's house. Can you bring them to me? They talked back and forth over the next 10 months. During the early morning hours, Sarah and the other detectives would answer texts and calls in the early morning. In a way, this is kind of a hint that Cassandra gets up earlier than Brandon does. Maybe she's the one who texted Sarah on Brandon's birthday. Cassandra also shared some information with Sarah that led her to suspect Cassandra of lying or decorating details. One of these would be Cassandra telling a story about how she heard about Brandon's death. In her statement, she said she had gone to check on Brandon's apartment and a neighbor told her the news about Brandon's death. When she explained to her what had happened, she said she was shocked and grieving and almost fell to the ground as she stood unsteady on her cane. But Sarah doesn't believe Cassandra. She then goes over to the apartment building and tries to locate the neighbor. She then asks the neighbor what his version of the event was. And as she knew Cassandra never came, and when she was told that Brandon was dead, she said, okay, thank you, and then she left. Sarah can realize that the more she engages with Cassandra, the more she finds out that Cassandra is a pathological liar. She makes things up, and she tries to inject herself into every part of the investigation. On November 14, 2019, the two met at a bookstore inside a mall in Asheboro, North Carolina. Cassandra's bizarre behavior and crocodile tears intrigued Sarah. She thinks Cassandra is expressing fake emotion. Sarah asked Cassandra for images or texts that she had of Brandon or with Brandon. Moreover, on December 20, 2019, Cassandra claimed that she knew where Brandon kept the spare key to his apartment and acknowledged her knowledge. Usually, she said, he would leave the door open for her if she requested it. In addition, she also left an audio recording for Sarah in which she described her dreams about the crime scene before the crime scene photos had been released. It appears that Cassandra now knows details which she could not possibly know. Her descriptions were pretty serious, especially about Brandon's body and how things were found in the apartment without her there. She, of course, uploaded these things to the Facebook page and forwarded them to the police, who have all been informed of these. Sarah fears that Cassandra knows more about what happened to Brandon than she lets on, so she is concerned. The police, however, aren't, so she's worried. Sadly, police are being rather tight-lipped. I find it a bit strange that they have been going back and forth with the investigators telling them about the cleanup now and then. They were discussing different details that happened at the apartment. But as far as I can tell, they have returned and collected more evidence, or to be more precise, have confirmed that there has been a cleanup of the hallway. But that seems to be all they do. Although they have already told the family, there's no foul play and there isn't a formal investigation underway at the moment. The medical examiner didn't help matters with his statement that it was a natural death as well. Even though Cassandra ends up being questioned by the police, this doesn't go very well. Having been asked for hours, Cassandra contacts Sarah on Facebook after her interview. She leaves an audio message for her. She said that a female detective was derogatory to Brandon. She said this detective seems to be trying to find information about him to paint a negative picture. I think she's telling Sarah, hey, the police don't think anything is going on with me, but they are trying to figure out what's wrong with Brandon. 
based on what the investigators are saying, I kind of believe Cassandra. She may be telling the truth here, but maybe not. Although all this sounds terrible, Sarah claims there was one male detective. She felt like he was investigating the case. But not long after, Cassandra was questioned. This detective was promoted and transferred. After he's gone, Sarah feels like any chance of getting answers is now lost. This detective told Sarah and her husband that I would like to speak again with Cassandra. I think we're getting close. He also got a warrant to investigate Cassandra's phone. After he moved, Sarah and her husband could not reach this detective, which is not surprising since he is not involved in the case anymore. But the female detective who said Brandon was probably on meth is now the detective who takes over the position. I guess the next excuse was that Brandon probably smoked synthetic marijuana. How freaky. Now we're from meth to pneumonia and freaking out. But then there's a cleanup, then synthetic marijuana and freaking out. All of those claims must be backed up by evidence. But no evidence. The autopsy report or toxicology report is required to support the claim. It's just what I thought. It sounded like maybe they wanted to close this matter. I wouldn't be surprised if there's a perception that Brandon isn't worth caring for. His case was not worth the time. This is a strong statement, but we have seen this in other cases. This would be a homicide or crime scene if the police came in and investigated everything. Then they determined it was self-inflicted. It is impossible to walk into this crime scene and decide it was self-inflicted. Everything about this crime scene suggests foul play. It is irrelevant if you will turn out to be right in the end. A snap judgment call of that magnitude cannot be made that quickly. This cannot be made right away. That doesn't work, and I'd rather hear it from a detective. The case is ongoing. We don't know what happened, probably doing this on meth, because as soon as your arguments prove to be false, you've lost all credibility in the eyes of these people. If you have an opinion, you should keep your mouth shut, and be sure to back it up with evidence. Sincerely, I am amazed by the diligence and motivation displayed by this mother here. Several months after Brandon's death, police sent AK summary crime scene photos, and the evidence logged Brandon's mother. The evidence log listed 24 items, most of which were destroyed. Now I mention some of these things. Though it appeared to have been clean, the handcuff key, the orange plastic hammer, and Brandon's cell phone were returned to Sarah. The family is trying to put pressure on detectives to find out what happened. At this point, they are trying to get information, and they are trying to figure out where things stand. Detective Johnson, who is the lead detective, says there is a long list of cases that they need to work on. Basically, the next best step would be to talk to the media about the situation. It is, of course, worth reporting when a reporter hears that the official cause of death was pneumonia. So, Sarah and her husband take their grievances to the Ashboro Police Department on August 2, 2020. They're not happy. They believe this case has gotten away from them. No one seems to be taking this seriously. I think this has to do with that evidence log that showed that a lot of evidence was just destroyed. There were other events returned, but the hammer was wiped clean. In total, the Brandon medical records consisted of 500 pages and 39 pages, and Sarah obtained these records on February 14, 2020. When she sees something alarming, she believes that he may have been poisoned. In a letter to the Ashboro Police Department, Sarah listed symptoms she believes indicate ethylene glycol poisoning. Brandon had been in the hospital almost seven months before his death, soon after Valentine's Day, which he spent with Cassandra now about his symptoms. Vomiting, he was unresponsive, had a headache, not intractable sepsis, even on a ventilator, his respiration continued to be abnormal. The attending physician noted on February 19th that Brandon had altered mental status. Brandon notified his mother not long after that he had lost or couldn't find the spare key he had made for his apartment. Even after his death, Brandon's father looked everywhere for the key but never found it. There are phone records and credit card records to prove Brandon wasn't alone two days before or on the day of his death. I find it alarming that he may have been poisoned months before, and since he was cremated, they cannot examine him.
I suggest that if this type of case is tested in the future, a second medical examiner's opinion should be obtained. Thank you so much for listening. We really appreciate all the support and patience you've shown us. We would also greatly appreciate your help if you could spread the word about this fantastic new true crime show with your friends and family. It is our mission to always tell the victim's story. At the same time, we wish to bring attention to some of the other issues that play a role in crime stories. It would also be greatly appreciated if you could share any suggestions you might have for future episodes. I think the more we collaborate, the more we will be able to ensure we tell stories that are relevant and that you want to hear. Thanks for joining me.